Happy Friday, everyone. We are back. I apologize that it's been a while since we've uploaded a video. We recently had spring break, followed by the Southeast Geological Society of America conference. But today, as you can probably tell from there being a different background behind me, we are not going to be doing a FOSS reports video. Instead, we are going to do our first viewer requested video. And this video will be on the megafauna of North America. So to get started, let's define what we actually mean by megafauna. Now, megafauna in its loosest sense just means large animal. Sometimes megafauna can really just mean any animal that was larger in the past than it is in the present. The term megafauna also usually refers to animals between the Pleistocene epoch and the present time. And sometimes having a loose definition can be beneficial to answering various paleontological questions. But what zoologists consider to be megafauna is generally anything above 40 kilograms or 90 pounds. A stricter definition that we often see in the literature is anything above 44 kilograms or 100 pounds. To keep this video relatively short, we are going to try to stick to animals in the Pleistocene that are over 44 kilograms. And even still, this is probably going to be a multi-part video. And so let's talk about some of the events in Earth's history leading up to the Pleistocene. So prior to the Pleistocene was an epoch known as the Pliocene, which lasted from about 5 to 2 million years ago. And during the Pliocene, and a little bit before the Pliocene, we had animals moving from North America to South America and from South America to North America in an event known as the Great American Biotic Interchange, or GAPI. Of particular note are the giant armadillos and ground sloths that migrated up from South America to North America. During the middle of the Pliocene epoch, about 3 million years ago, there was a brief warming period. And following this warming period around 3 million years ago was a cooling trend. And this cooling trend continued into the Pleistocene epoch, which started at about 2 million years ago. So you may be aware of the Pleistocene epoch by another name, the Ice Ages. Yes, I did say Ice Ages with an S, and we'll get into why the plural makes a lot more sense than just a singular Ice Age in a second. And this time is characterized by a series of warm or interglacial and cold glacial periods. And this emphasizes the point that it was just not one event, that this was actually a cycle of warming and cooling. The world was not completely frozen during this time. In North America, while the glacial ice sheets did cover most of Canada, they really only reached a few northern states. And when you think about it in an ecological context, that makes actually a lot of sense. Right? You can't have large megafauna when everything is completely frozen over. You can't grow any plants with a giant glacier on the ground. And of course the plants support the herbivores, the herbivores support the carnivores, etc, etc. So now that we have our stage set, let's talk about the fauna themselves. It's estimated that species from about 40 different genera went extinct between the Pleistocene and the Holocene, the following epoch. And this number comes to us from a 2006 paper by Koch and Barnowski. And keep in mind, there can be multiple species within a genus. So in terms of how many species went extinct, well, that is partly up for debate. Because really any field in biology, we kind of get down to what constitutes a species, and it can get really tricky and challenging at times. Now, 40 is a large number to tackle. So let's break this down into a few noteworthy and obscure examples starting with the elephant in the room. Or should I say, elephants? With the order Proboscidea. In North America, we see three genera go extinct and the entire order extirpated from North America. Extirpated is a word we use to describe an extinction at a more local scale. The word extinction typically means that a species has gone extinct at a global scale. So to talk about a smaller scale extinction, we use the word extirpated. This would include the Gompithia cuvieonius, in addition to the mastodons and the mammoths. The Gompithiers are an extinct family of elephants with really awkward shaped tusks, is the easiest way to describe them. They're really bizarre looking, so here's another graphic of other examples. Both Gompithiers and mastodons have cusped teeth, 
which makes it really good for browsing, or in other words, eating plant materials such as twigs, fruits, and large leaves. Mammoth teeth are lovodont, meaning that they have lots of ridges, which is really good for grazing, or eating lots of grasses. However, almost certainly the resources of these three animals would have overlapped at some place and some time in history. Although the sorts of teeth that we listed are optimized for those certain plant groups, it certainly does not exclude them from eating other plants. More than likely you have heard of the woolly mammoth, Mammothus primigenius. But did you know there's actually more than one species of mammoth? In addition to the woolly mammoth, we also recognize the Columbia mammoth, which was present in the majority of the lower 48. The woolly mammoth can be found in northern states, including Alaska, as well as Canada. However, new genetic research shows that some species of mammoth were interbreeding in North America, which would imply that there might actually not be multiple species. The differences observed in the skeletons could just be due to ecophenotypic variation, or having an appearance that reflects your environment. But to the best of my knowledge, people still regard the woolly mammoth and Columbia mammoth as separate species. So now that we've looked at probably the most famous herbivore, let's transition to the most famous carnivores. Arguably the most well-known Pleistocene carnivore would be the saber-toothed cat, or Smilodon. However, there is also another genus of long-toothed cat in North America during the Pleistocene. This was called Homotherium. There is also the North American cheetah, the Morassinonyx, and two different lion species. Both species are now extinct, with one species being Pantherus balaea, the steppe lion, which lived in the Yukon and extended all the way over into Eurasia, and the other being Panthera atrox. No, not that atrox. The American lion Panthera atrox. And while we're on the topic of saber teeth, let's talk about one of the most beloved characters from the franchise, Ice Age. And while Scrap definitely would not measure up to what we would call a megafauna, sadly there are actually no saber-toothed squirrels. Also, I don't really know what you are. Your dental formula doesn't quite match up to that of a squirrel's either anyway. You have way too many incisors. Sorry, buddy. So while we're off at a fun note, I think I'm gonna cut it short right here. Like I said, we're hoping to make this a multi-part series. So stay tuned for next time when we talk about giant ground sloths, drivers of extinction, and also the survivors, which we really haven't talked about too much right now. If you like this video, please remember to share, like, comment, and subscribe. Follow us on all of our social media platforms, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and the My Fossil app. Also check out our website, www.myfossil.org. Thanks for watching. Bye.